Creating Change with Doug Foresta, a show dedicated to creativity and emotional healing. Creating Change on Empower Radio. EmpowerRadio.com. Here's your host, Doug Foresta. Hello and welcome to Creating Change. I'm really excited to have uh, my guest with me today. We haven't actually had a guest in a while and I'm really excited to, to have a guest for the show, someone that I think really embodies this idea of creating change. My guest is Michael Schwartz. Uh, he is a filmmaker. You can learn more about him at trailheadproductions.com. That's trailheadproductions.com forward slash palette, P-A-L-E-T-T-E. Michael Schwartz, thanks for joining me on Creating Change. You bet, Doug. Very glad to be here. Thanks. So let's say a little bit about your, uh, your, your background. How long, first of all, when did you start making films? I am new to the filmmaking world, but I've been a visual storyteller for pretty much as long as I can remember. I was that annoying kid with the camera when I was a kid. Um, I told stories any way I could growing up, went into television news after college, started a video production company after I left news and have been moving that from video production, working with nonprofits and corporate clients as well into now documentary filmmaking. So what was it about like visual storytelling and, and, and visual production that you liked? Like, what do you think it was that drew you to that? I love the idea of marrying words to pictures, especially when it's in a way that lets the picture tell some of the story and not just mimicking the video. One of the examples I give when I speak is a new airline is being created and I'm covering the story. And the video is the first flight. The plane is taking off. And the conventional way to write to that picture is to say X airlines had their first flight today and it's en route to wherever. I think a better way is to let the picture tell the story and write something along the lines of, X Airlines is finally ready for takeoff. You know, to be able to use your creativity in the visual realm and match it to words that say something in a way that expands your understanding of the story. I love writing, I love editing, and I've loved shooting and putting all those tools together has just felt like a calling for me for really as long as I've been doing this. And, you know, we, I know that we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the palette project and what that is, but I know that, you know, one of the things I see when I talk to organizations and social change and organizations across the U.S. is that they oftentimes have reasons why you know, they can't be doing, <laughs> they can't be doing the things <laughs> they're doing. But one of the reasons I'm excited to have you on is because you're a great example of someone who is, you're getting it done despite, despite any challenges that get in your way. And one of the challenges that, uh, that you have, I, I don't necessarily want to call it a challenge, but I mean, I'm sure it is a challenge to some degree is the fact that you are actually visually impaired, correct? That is correct. And I have to say, I really don't mind that you're calling it a challenge because it is a challenge and it's a heavy lift for us to wrap our heads around the idea of visual storytelling while being visually impaired. And I think it's productive to think of it as a challenge because challenges can be handled. Right. It's when you think of the challenge or it's when you think of something as an obstacle, that's yeah. when you're in trouble. Right. Yeah, I agree with that too. And you know, I mean, the thing about challenges is we, we all, we may not, know what it's like to be visually impaired, someone listening to this, but we all know what it's like to have challenges, you know? And I, I think what I see a lot of times is people say, well, because I have this challenge, I'm not going to do it. You know? And what I love about you, Michael, is that, you know, you are someone who says, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let this challenge stop me. And so one of the questions that I asked, that I'll ask you, uh, I know you were on, you were actually, I'm going to plug for a moment, your episode with Deborah Rue on Human Potential at Work to say, I know you spoke about this a bit, but I'm sure one of the questions that you get asked quite a bit is, well, how on earth can you be a visual storyteller if you're visually impaired? Do you want to kind of share with our listeners how you're able to do that? I will. And by all means, plug Deborah's podcast. It was a <laughs> great interview. Go. I really enjoyed being on it. The thing is this, creativity, and that's how I've earned my bones over the years. It's a team sport. The idea of the lonely artist sitting in his loft creating art is kind of a myth. 
And when you take that idea and run with it, this challenge of being visually impaired, and I have been losing my sight in fits and spurts for more than 30 years. So this is something that I've more than learned how to wrap my head around. You go from there and you say, all right, well, this is one, the challenge. Two, I have really an opportunity that some other people might not have that I've had time to prepare for this, this gradual degradation in my sight, knowing what the possibilities are down the road. It's given me time to come to terms with that and time to come up with solutions. You know, we, we talked about at the beginning of this conversation that this is the idea what I do, marrying words and pictures and editing, you shoot, you edit, you write, it all comes together. Well, yes, I do have to admit the shooting part is not as easy as it once was and it's not sure. going to get any easier. Right. But that's why I keep on coming back to this idea that creativity is a team sport. I have been working with a creative vision for my entire professional life. And when you're in news, for example, I never picked up a camera after my first couple of years when well, that first couple of years, I was like the Bugs Bunny character in the old uh, Warner Brothers cartoons where you're wandering around, you know, and you've got every instrument on every part of your body and the oompa drum on your foot. That was me for a while. But then as you grow professionally and you move from market to market, you work as part of a photographer and editor and reporter team that gets the story done. That was the best training I could possibly have for the situation I'm in because, yes, my eyesight is on a downward trajectory, but I have, I'm proud of the fact that my team has such good communication that when I'm wearing my director's hat on the occasions that are more frequent than they were when I'm not behind the camera, that I know that when I'm sitting down to marry those words and pictures and edit it, it's a lot more than just the mechanics of what I do. It's knowing how we all fit together as a team and how we're going to get this story told. So that's taken me through these challenges. And right now it's taking me around the world. So I'm okay with it. You know, I, I, one of the takeaways there for me is, and I feel the same way, you know, I don't, I started off doing everything <laughs> myself, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. podcasting. And, you know, now I have, as, as I've expanded, I have a team and I have people who, you know, I, I have um, a, a studio I work with in Chicago and somebody in, in New Mexico. And I have, you know, a team really all across the U.S. of people that help me. And I think one of the great takeaways here is that if you're, it's funny because I know that one of the questions I ask myself now when I have challenges is what support do I need to get this done? You know, what, what's the, instead of, instead of what I think, uh, what I used to do <laughs> and what I see a lot of people do, which is, well, we can't do it because we don't, because, because we can't, because we don't know how to do it. You know, we can't, we can't, you know, I'm talking about now, let's say nonprofits or uh, mission driven organizations. Well, we can't get our message out there because we don't have the in-house expertise. We don't have the budget. We don't have this. We don't have that. Those are real challenges, right? Losing, you know, losing your eyesight is a challenge. I agree. I appreciate that you say, you know, Hey, let's call it what it is. It's a challenge. A, a challenge doesn't, it doesn't mean, I don't think we're on this planet to, to fold <laughs> when, when we, when we have challenges, no. uh, you're right. I mean, it's just, it doesn't, to me, I don't know. I mean, I feel like you seem like that kind of person where you're driven and you're going to do this no matter what. You know, I, what you're saying, you're preaching to the choir, Doug, because one of my favorite ways to end a phrase, I, I'm a big fan of counterintuitive thinking. And on the admittedly rare occasions where I'm asked, you know, what what would you do? You know, what's your advice? Um, I, I like to end a lot of the advice with the phrase, you're not doing it right. And I need to qualify that because this is not in an accusatory way. It's more to show what our workflow should be like in the face of challenges. And so let's put that in, in let's put that phrase in this context. If you're not being challenged, you're not doing it right. <laughs> right. 
You know, if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. That's right. And I, it it goes across the board. You know, as a storyteller, I often say that if you end a documentary or if you end a project with the same story that you started out to tell, you're not doing it right. Yeah. If everything went easy, you're not doing it right. Right. Because what we do, no matter what we do, even a job we've been doing for 20 years, you've got to find ways to challenge yourself. Now, look, this is not a challenge it, when I was 13 years old, if somebody said, hey, you you want to do this for the next 30 years and incorporate this challenge? Um, given the choice, I would have said, uh, I'll pass. Right. But you work with the hand you're dealt. And I feel very fortunate that the hand I was dealt was one, the desire to be able to the desire to do this as a calling and the good fortune to have been given opportunities and to work for the opportunities to do it. So it's okay that these are my particular challenges. Other people have other challenges. And if, if I don't recognize those challenges and the people I work with, then I'm not doing it right. I think it's, I think working with our own individual choices and challenges is one of those things that just brings us all together. And when we respect that as a community, that makes what we do just that much more fulfilling and, and just and richer. Amen. Let's talk about the Palette Project. Uh, I mentioned it at the top of the show. Can you tell people what that is? And Sure. Sure. The documentary and the associated seven part series that goes along with it is called The Palette Project, Losing Sight, Maintaining a Vision. And I take that tagline very seriously because it speaks to this idea that the physical process of losing your eyesight is a completely different concept than what your vision for your life should be. And as I really started really embarking down this road over the last few years um, with the eyesight getting worse and worse as I got older and the effects of this particular genetic condition coming more to the foreground, part of me really just was motivated to get going even, even harder than I had been before with the team that I've been working with, but to put this desire to travel around the world, which so many people have, and rightfully so, the world is a big place with a lot of nooks and crannies to explore. But I wanted to tell this story through two contexts. One, through the context of other people I'm meeting along the way, because travel is about the people you meet and not the scenery that you see and tell their stories. And I'm finding these stories, these remarkable stories of accomplishment and achievement from visually impaired and disabled men, women, and children around the world. You know, blind sailors crossing the Cook Strait between the North and South Islands of New Zealand. Visually impaired entrepreneurs in the, in the Middle East that are creating wearable technology for blind people to navigate the world. And story after story after story. And with that framework in mind, what I really wanted to do was take this concept of color as a framework and really just blow it to pieces. And we've talked about this off mic, but let me bring it up for people listening. Sure. We think of concepts in terms of color and we go into such cliches. You know, if I say I'm feeling blue today. Right. Right. Everybody knows exactly what that means. It means I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling lonely. Well, not when I was in New Zealand and not when I was with this crew of blind sailors on the blue waters of the Pacific Ocean. I mean, they love what they do. They love racing these keelboats against fully sighted and non-sighted competitors alike. And you step off the dock with them and you've never been with a happier, more passionate group of people. And I love the idea. That's what blue is to them. And I wanted to explore that the, throughout the entire palette of color. What do we think a color represents? And let me show you some people who might think about it differently. And it's just, this has been the joy of my life, taking this journey. It's really, I love, I love what you're doing. I mean, what do you think has been 
the most surprising things for you so far along this journey? Are there any things that you just thought, like you said, you know, you said, if you don't learn anything, when you start out to do a project, <laughs> you know, if it, if it turns out exactly the way you thought it would, then you're not doing it right. What's been, <laughs> yes. what's been surprising, most surprising to you so far? You mean other than how just truly, truly awful Vegemite actually tastes? <laughs> when you... <laughs> I've heard it's terrible. Um, I know. Yeah. The song says, uh, makes it oh. sound so wonderful. What does it taste like? It's this heavily salted vegetable compote. Ugh. Compote. Um, and the Aussies, they, they put it on everything. And I just can't do it. I can't. I tried <laughs> and it's just, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm told that when I go to some other countries in the Netherlands that I'm going to, uh, or Iceland, I'm going to, that, that I'll yearn for the days of Vegemite when I try a dish called Harlcut, which is a kind of rotting shark meat that, that Icelanders just wonderful. seem to love. Yeah. Um, but uh, right now, Vegemite, uh, it, it, it takes the cake. Sorry, anybody from, um, uh, Australia, who's listening to this? I tried, I really did. But no, I understand what you're saying. Um, so let me tell you about this Aborigine that I met um, when I was at when we were shooting at Uluru. I'm so used to this idea of being on camera and people just kind of agreeing with whatever you say during the course of an interview because everybody knows the game. The conversation is supposed to flow a certain way, and right. you're supposed to reach a certain moral at the end of the story. And I'd been trying for weeks and weeks to get this interview with this representative of the Ananu tribe of Aborigines in the Australian Outback. And just as an aside, um, it's just as hard as you think it is to try to reach an <laughs> Aborigine in the Outback um, without phone or email. I was going to say, you can't um, call their secretary, can you? It doesn't work. Um, there is no Skype. It's it, that's not the way it works. Um, but we got the uh, we got the interview and we're sitting in the shadow of this enormous monolith. And he knows exactly why I'm there and what I'm trying to drive at, which is what can a visually impaired person get out of a visit to Uluru when you either can't fully see or you can't see at all this enormous almost 1000 meter high um five kilometers around monolith in the middle middle of the outback and i'm trying to get him to say or i'm hoping he's going to say oh there's so much you can enjoy with all the senses so much you can get from a spiritual level so i tee up the question and it's like this is this is all but literally teeing up the ball and i say what can you tell me about how I can fully experience what Uluru is all about. And he says, well, you really can't. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, insert Homer Simpson-esque. Oh, right, here. right, exactly. And I'm like, well, you know, you could almost hear that wah, wah. Like, God, don't tell me I got like an Aborigine who's like just not on board with the idea of ability and accomplishment. And so we, I said, well, what do you mean? This is a little upsetting to me. And he goes on to explain. And what he's really saying, um, what, what he was saying is nobody who is at a certain point in their life can appreciate the spiritual connection to this place unless you have been raised on the land and it's just part of your bones. It's now, not we because can, you're blind. It's not because you're visually impaired. Exactly. It was right. because I was to him someone other. Right. And, you know, Doug, we can argue all day long whether he was correct or not. And right. I've had that discussion with him about whether you, when you reach what he thought was basically beyond 30 years old, whether it's just too late for somebody who's not of that land to fully appreciate it and be energetically connected. And that's OK. I'll have that discussion with him every day and right. enjoy it. And the reason I'll enjoy it, and this was really just some, an, an awakening experience for me, because by him answering me that way, he was actually answering exactly the way I was hoping he would in a rather obscure way. He was 100% equating me, a visually impaired traveler, with 
everybody else who's right. coming and climbing, climbing on his rock and eating the, you know, and eating the kangaroo burgers and taking a picture and going away. And I was like, at, at the end of the day, I, I said, thank you. Yeah. Because you have given me the great honor of just equating me with everyone else. We'll disagree and we'll continue the discussion. And we have because they're working on ways to make Uluru more accessible to mobility impaired and uh, visually impaired and cognitively impaired people around the world who want to come to this place. And I love that those discussions happen. But yes, it was definitely a surprising moment. I I love that. And I love the idea that, you know, you're, you know, I would have thought the same thing when he said, well, you can't. And you're like, it's because I'm visually impaired, isn't it? No, it's just because you're American. And, you know, he, he <laughs> yes. had the same level of disdain. <laughs> for, I think that's. Yeah, this, this this aborigine who, by the way, was wearing a Yankees baseball cap in the middle of the outback. Um, and, you know, I was so expecting when I met him um, to that, that, you know, we see all these National Geographic specials and Anthony Bourdain specials where right. we're meeting aborigines and they're in tribal garb and with the with the paint and the right. colors i was expecting that and when he shows up with a wearing a t-shirt promoting his his group's uh tour co company <laughs> and the yankees cap i'm like you know that's not television that's friendly i'm thinking but you know, i want to take 10 seconds to say that's okay too because you know what it's not his job to perform for me it's his job to be exactly who he is every day and that was great. If I had to take 10 seconds to explain to the audience that somebody that looks like a gentleman you might meet, you know, in the hate in San Francisco is a member of an Outback Aborigine tribe. Don't let the T-shirt and the cap <laughs> fool you. That's good, too. You know, that's, that's right. another lesson learned, you know. And I, I think what's so great, I mean, I think you're just such a perfect guest for creating change, Michael, because your example of what you're doing is to me so inspiring for others to go out and find their own way, not to imitate what you're doing, but to find their own way to share their stories and to have their own adventures. And I want to make sure that, uh, that we, uh, that we, you know, that uh, my listeners support you in this journey. Can you tell people how they can uh, find out about the palette project and also how they can uh, support you in your, in, in your journey? I would love to. And thank you for the opportunity, Doug. Sure. I would encourage anybody who likes what they're hearing right now, whether it's from the perspective of an armchair traveler or someone who wants to realize their own creative visions or someone that just wants to see a really cool series and movie about some really cool people and maybe even even pick up a few travel hacks along the way to go to the film's website. And the website is Trailhead productions.com it's all strung together trailheadproductions.com slash palette like a painter's palette p-a-l-e-t-t-e -T -T -E. and when you get there just become engaged the first thing you'll see and i would love this is a link to our crowdfunding page on patreon um and it says right there you know Back me, support me on Patreon. And, you know, I'm not asking you to like, you know, cut a thousand dollar or a ten thousand or a hundred thousand dollar check. I'm asking you to subscribe for, say, a couple dollars for the video feed. You know, I ask people to become part of the community that is following this because we don't do this flying solo. We do this by people seeing the movie as it progresses one webisode at a time and then being cut into a film and series and people saying what they like and just as importantly telling me what we could do better because if this is not a two-way conversation then what's the point you can you can go to a lecture at your local community college and find out everything you want to about world history and world uh, world heritage sites but we should be making this journey together. So I would just encourage everybody to go to that website, look at the different ways to become engaged. If it's crowdfunding and that's how you can help, then I'm just honored that you would do that. If it's becoming a part of the Facebook page, please be a part of that. This film needs an audience. If it's subscribing to the newsletter, 
also, you have my thanks. Just be part of the conversation and any way you can support these efforts is just truly humbling. Thank you. And we'll put those links on the show page as well. Michael Schwartz, thank you for joining me on Creating Change and for being an example of Creating Change. Thank you, Doug. And thank you for having me. It's been a real, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for listening. Remember, keep creating. The world needs your voice. We'll be back next time on Creating Change.